We have today a very special guest. His name is Pratik Naik. He is a successful commercial and high-end retoucher, owner of solsticeretouch.com. Um, and he will be joining us today, talking to us a little bit about his background, a little bit about um, his work, and also giving us some tips on how to survive in these um, unique times. So let's give everyone a warm welcome to Tik Naik. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. And I would love that everyone can turn on their camera so we can see you and then that way it's a very interactive class, okay? Awesome. This is cool. Where, um, is everybody from San Francisco as well from the class or are they all over the place? Um, well, there is people located in the Bay Area. Uh, yeah. At this point, um, it might be people in some other areas of, of the world, but I think uh, majority we're all in the side of the Bay Area and in California as well. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I see a lot of people are still joining. So do you want to wait a couple more minutes or are we good to go? Um, it's fine because we're also recording this. So we'll be sharing with everyone. So I think awesome. we can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Edwin actually sent over a few questions that I wanted to talk about before we get into some Q&A. Um, what I do want to say, though, is make sure that you guys have some questions that you want to ask me because after the first maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, um, we'll open it up to the class in case anybody has any specific questions um, for me regarding Capture One or retouching or anything like that. So I'd be, I would love to answer whatever you guys have in mind. Um, if for whatever reason, we don't get a chance to address any questions today. You can email me anytime. I'm pretty much at home, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> and so I'll be happy to answer um, some of your questions. Edwin was really nice to reach out to me and ask to be a part of this. And uh, I wanted to be here because I think for me, um, hearing about the journey other creatives have gone through has, had really helped me in the beginning when I first started retouching and, and you know setting up my career. So um, a little bit about myself, for those of you who might not know um, about me and the background, I have been retouching for a professionally full-time uh, eight years. And before that, I've also been retouching part-time for three years. And um, my journey actually began uh, with Photoshop in the year, I think it was like 2000 or 99. I started with um, Photoshop 6.0. It was back then, uh, I was in high school. And for me, I actually started using Photoshop for graphic design and for digital painting. And I remember when I was in high school, I actually started um, being introduced to, to Photoshop uh, through a class called animation and, and design where I would have to create animations for things. But instead of actually doing animations, um, we ended up making memes before they were memes. And we, <laughs> we created a bunch of, you know, graphics and... And for me, Photoshop, the introduction to it was really fun. I, ha I got really excited in the potential and what was possible. And I loved drawing and painting when I was going through school. So I ended up um, using Photoshop for things like car manipulations. I entered a lot of Photoshop contests. And I never really knew I was going to use turn that into a career and a profession. So from there, uh, I picked up a camera and I knew eventually the computer and Photoshop was a big evolution for me when it came to turning my art into a profession and, and t turning my art and transforming it into something completely different. So photography came about when I was in college and I went to school for um, hotel management and it was completely different from what I did as my career. But the actual career made me realize I wanted to actually be in the arts and in ph photography and retouching more so than actually business. So I ended up um, spending my college doing that degree. But while I was doing that degree, I was so driven to make it as a retoucher and as somebody who could um, push the boundaries for the Photoshop side of things that I ended up um, spending a couple of years working after college. But in the evenings and the weekends and pretty much any other spare time that I had, I ended up building a portfolio, networking a lot, and then growing my portfolio and finding work. And that's how eventually I started to um, jump out of my career in the hotel world and then into the professional retouching world. So that's kind of how I began. Um, and my expertise primarily relies um, on skin retouching, which I do. And that's one of my favorite things to do is a lot of skin editing. 
And um, obviously Capture One as part of my workflow is pretty much everything that I do starts with Capture One, especially the raw stage, and then eventually goes to the retouching side. So, you know, in the last eight years, most of my work has been either beauty or fashion um, in the commercial or editorial world and a lot of personal projects. So photographers typically hire me for um, either campaigns, they either hire me for editorial work or personal work that they're using to build their portfolio. Because a lot of photographers test a lot, especially because they are trying to continually evolve their book. And for that, they need specific, um, you know, retouching done for that in order to get where they're trying to go. And also with retouching and photographers, typically they tend to stick with the retoucher that they're working with. So I found it really handy because with retouching and post-production, when you have somebody that you're working with, they tend to stick with you through a long period of time when they know that you're reliable and you know, you're good with communication. So that was my, my biggest asset was the communication part and how I was able to um, actually maintain those relationships and, and push it forward. So that's kind of what my, my background is in terms of the retouching and, and post-production side. And um, another question that Edwin asked me to talk about is kind of what my workflow is between Capture One and what I do when I look at an image for the first time. And another question that he asked me was, um, what do I prefer in terms of Capture One to Photoshop? And I wanna kind of talk about that a little bit. Most of this I imagine you might already know, but maybe seeing it from a viewpoint of somebody who's doing it um, like myself might you know, give you some questions that you might also wanna ask later. So I'm gonna jump into it. And uh, um, is it possible to also screen share as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and screen share uh, my side. Let me make sure that I have Capture One open and not some like weird game or something. <laughs> and then I'll jump straight into Capture One. All right, let's see here. Um, and then screen share. It says host disabled attendee screen share. Oh, one second. Um, there you go. Um, not you. All right, co host. Okay. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and share. All right, so you guys can see that. However, let me shrink the screen a little bit because it's actually hiding behind the thumbnails. Okay, there we go. So um, one of the things that I, I like to do when it comes to Capture One is I always tend to use sessions instead of catalogs. And Edwin, I actually want to ask you what point in the curriculum are, are the students in regards to usage of Capture One? Um, well, at this point, they have uh, understood all of the sessions, catalogs, layers. So they are pretty advanced. They haven't reached a higher level of Capture One. There's yep. another class, but um, they understand all the workflow. Fantastic. Okay, great. Because I, <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to take time explaining like sessions versus catalogs because that is the number one question people get confused with: is catalogs versus sessions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so I operate typically in a session format where I'm pretty much once I once I've done my shoot, and I'm also a photographer as well, so I shoot a lot. Um, I also edit my own photos and also edit for other people, and so when I when I'm actually done with the shoot, um, I'll tether. On, la on set if I have the ability to do that. Um, and, or if I'm digi tacking for people who um, I'm on set with or I'm on location with, we'll bring the laptop and set up a session and then you know shoot right away so that I have all my files there. And that way, in case I need to make any edits on the fly and show them specific color grades, um, then it gets applied to every single other image in the session. So that makes it really easy for me to take that session, go to post-production immediately, and then start working. Um, the things that I typically look for when I'm actually editing a photo is once the actual selection process is done, whether that's communicating with the photographer directly or them sending me their, their selects, I'll have everything laid out for me um, in, the, in the way that I'm actually looking to edit. Um, and I'll have my selects there, the ones that I'm gonna be actually editing. This one's a little bit different, I've actually, culled a lot of my photos, but um, I haven't finalized them um, yet. So what I'll do is once I've narrowed down, let's say I wanna use um, this particular image as an example, what I tend to do first and foremost is ultimately I'll come down to my white balance and white balance is something that either I do on set if I have the ability to do so, 
Or this is something I communicate with a photographer and I ask them if I need to change the white balance or not. More than likely, most photographers will tell me that they want a specific white balance. Sometimes they don't tell me, in which I do, I do clarify and ask, and I go with what I, what I believe should be the proper white balance. Typically, this isn't always going to be based on using a gray card. This can also be based on the feeling that they're going for, whether they want a warmer look or a colder look. That starts there. And I'll show them um, what I'm going to be doing before I actually process the files. Because there's been many times where I've assumed a lot of information, whether that's you know what I need to edit, what kind of color grade I'm looking for, um, what type of information should I keep and shouldn't keep. So once the preliminary um, settings are done in the raw stage, I'll send them um, some previews or proofs just to clarify and make sure that that's the exact look that they're going for before retouching the file. Um, so a lot of communication does happen because this image was shot by me and I'm quote unquote the client. I can make a lot of the artistic and the a lot of the artistic directions uh, right away. Number one for me is always going to be um, the highlights. I I never want to see a lot of blown out highlights if it's not intentional. So aside from white balance, which I'm going to leave as shot because this was kind of what I was going for um, while I was shooting it, but white balance is one and then exposure and and highlights and shadows is another one so you see i've done actually some settings already let me go ahead and reset this really quick here and then this was the one this is how it looked out of camera pretty much and so the first thing is you'll notice that the highlights themselves the the information is already pretty present and i know this because if i actually hover over the brightest areas of the image i can see the readouts at the top at the moment it says you know, like 181 in the red channel, 146 in the green channel, 100 in the blue channel, and then 152 is like the luminance basically, or like the average. And so what this gives me an idea is how bright the highlights are. And in this case, it's really not that bright. And I think it's actually quite underexposed, visually speaking. Um, when it comes to images that are overexposed or underexposed, I try not to do a general like readout of the numbers. I tend to look at it and make a, a visual estimate of what I'm going for. And for me, just the instinctive idea of the fact that this looks like it's a little bit underexposed gives me the permission to expose it even more. And exposure is something, again, that's very personal. But for me, I think this looks a little bit more balanced than it was before. And then what I'll do here is, again, look at the, the brightest part of the image, make sure that nothing's blown out. Um, and nothing's at 255, which is um, clipping, um, especially my red channel, because I don't want that to be clipped or look too hot, because that looks really weird in print and web as well. So the red tones are very important to me, especially skin tones. And so that looks pretty good. And if I do want to bring back any highlights, I'll always use the highlight slider. I think it does a pretty good job in comparison to the other options that are there. So I don't want to tweak anything else too much in that respect. Um, the other thing is going to be my shadows. I noticed there's some shadow detail loss happening, especially here. Even though it's not saying zero, the information really isn't there a ton. So I want to bring that out just a little bit. Um, I'm going to bring up my shadows here really quick like this. And if I feel like it's bringing the exposure up too much across the entire image, instead what I'll do is go ahead and add um, layers instead and then kind of mask it out manually. The way that I personally like to use layers is a little bit different than what Capture One tends to advertise. And for me, I tend to, instead of adding a layer um, and then making adjustments, the reason why they do that is because once you add a layer, and let me just go through this visually, if I go ahead and add a layer, like adjustment layer one, I'm gonna rename this to shadows. If I decide to say, bring up my shadows here, it doesn't give me a visual representation of how much this effect has across either the entire image or in this particular area. So what I like to do instead is instead of that, I'm gonna go ahead and right click. I'm gonna say invert mask. What happens now is that any change that I make to this particular layer um, applies globally. It doesn't apply with a black mask on top of it. And you won't be able to see a difference, except um, if you invert the mask, um, you'll notice that nothing's happening, which means that I like to say the mask is black because I like to use Photoshop terms in comparison. I'm gonna go ahead and invert that again. 
So now you can see everything happen across the image. This way, I can decide whether or not I want to use, say, the shadows or the exposure. And honestly, most of the time, I think exposure works really well because it uniformly brings up the exposure and brightness across the entire image. So when you bring, when you mask it back in, it looks a lot more natural. So what I do is I'm actually paying attention to the hair right now and making sure that there's some detail in the hair. And I think that looks pretty good. And the exposure or shadows look, you know, relatively similar. So I'm going to go ahead and use this as my setting. Now, once I have my setting pretty much done, I'm going to go back to my layer and say invert mask again. And then I'm going to start using my adjustment brush to, to, to brush it in. So now once I have my adjustment brush there, I'm using my bracket keys on my keyboard to change my brush size. And I'm going to change my settings. My settings that I always use when I'm, when I'm masking in Capture One is I tend to keep my opacity at 100 and then bring my flow uh, quite low between you know, 1 to 3. I don't know why they have a 0 because it doesn't do anything if you're at 0% flow. So I keep it to like one or one to three percent is typically what I do, and this is something that I do for um, Photoshop as well. One thing that I also do is I um, turn off airbrush or use pen pressure, and the reason for that is even in Photoshop I don't really use pen pressure when I'm using a Wacom tablet. I yeah, I like to make sure that the um, pen size or the brush size itself is going to be the same from start to finish. Like I want to know exactly what that is. I don't want to keep changing my brush size um, because I want to make sure it's precise. And if the brush size keeps changing with pen pressure, then I don't really get the precise, precise results that I'm, I'm looking for. The other thing that I, I always try to, to do is I, I make sure that the mask is never displayed or um, only display while drawing if you wanted to. And I just find that it just gets in, in the way for me when I'm working so that now I can see the results coming in. I don't have to worry about the red mask being shown constantly. So I always, double, I always make sure that never display mask is on. Um, then I'm gonna go and start working. And what I'll do here is I'm gonna zoom in like so. And then I'm gonna start brushing. And then what happens is gradually any detail that I want to bring in in the shadows can start coming in. If it's not fast enough or if it's not enough, I can always change my pressure as well or the flow, I should say, and bring it up a little bit more and then start working. And because the recording's going in terms of the zoom, um, it'll be a little bit slower, but it should start working. There we go. And I just want to make sure any details that I, I really want to make sure that does come through does actually show up. Um, there's, it doesn't really necessarily mean that you have to recover every single detail in the shadows across the image. But if I feel like something is being completely clipped to the point where it's very distracting, I'll go ahead and start just kind of painting that in really gently. And this isn't something that you know, I, I do across every single image. This is a discussion that I always have with, with photographers, whether or not they want that detail there. Because sometimes they intentionally kind of crush the shadows for effect purposes. Um, but this gives you a good idea of what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to turn this layer on and off. And you can see what a big difference um, that makes. In case I want to bring something back, I'll just use the eraser brush and then you know, erase that back in. Um, but that's kind of what my, what my process is in terms of masking and what I look for there. Let me go ahead and erase a little bit of that in because that highlight was really, really intense. And that's a bit better. And because it has opacity, I'll sometimes globally just change the opacity if I need to across the image. Now, once I'm done actually balancing out um, the shadows and highlights and getting the white balance there, I also like to go ahead and sometimes use the, um, let's see, where is it called? The color editor. Now the color editor is something that I use very specifically. I don't use it all the time. Um, sometimes I'll use it to even out skin tones. I'll use it to shift colors from one point to another. Um, I don't know, have you guys already talked about the color editor in class, in your class yet? Um, uh, we have um, another of our professors here, Michael Sins, and he briefly gave them an um, explanation of the 
a color editor. We okay. haven't get too deep in, in, in it yet. Oh, great, perfect. So just to give you a, a, a quick idea, I'm gonna go ahead and on my layers and click on my background first so that it applies to the background and, and not to the, to the shadows layer here because otherwise it won't work. If you ever find a tool doesn't work in Capture One, just check your layers and make sure that it's not on a layer that's already masked in for whatever reason. Um, now here in the color editor, and I'm using Capture One 20, um, and the, it's, it's the most recent update um, that just came out. And you'll notice because it has this specific icon here, it's a different logo altogether. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but once I have my um, color editor up, the way that I actually like using it is there's this tab here called Skin Tone. And Skin Tone allows me to actually unify different colors within the skin itself, or not even just the skin, but across the range of whatever it is that you're trying to unify. And by unify, I mean that, let's say, for instance, you know, the arm might be a little bit different color than the face or whatever it is then you can unify those skin tones a little bit closer. Um, but of course, this is not something you wanna do all the time. If there's maybe something that um, doesn't require it, then you don't need to do this. It's not something you have to do for every single image. Um, but I feel like you know, it can be handy in times when um, there's different tones happening across the particular image. The one thing that I do have to say with the skin tone editor, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, uh, cause I have a lot of other things I wanna discuss and get into some of your questions. But with the skin tone editor, what happens is once I um, come to the skin tone tab here, nothing's actually visible. So what you have to do is you have to activate the tool itself. And the way to do that is there's actually a color picker here at the bottom right of the tool, which says pick skin color, where did it go? It says pick skin color correction. And what that basically means is that I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on say, um, some of the colors of the skin. And what happens is automatically it starts and pulls up this range of tones that it highlights and selects. Now, just by looking at the image, you won't even know what those tones are, except at the bottom left, there is a checkbox that says view selected color range. When I click on that, what happens is anything that's saturated means that it's selected. Anything that's not saturated means that it's not selected. So let's analyze this real quick. Let me actually, uh, let me see if I can do this. I'm going to um, bring this color editor out, maybe if that makes a difference. Where did it go? Oh, it kind of disappeared on me. Let me just go and add that back in. I right clicked. I'm gonna say um, color editor. Let's see, where did it go? There it is, color editor. Okay, maybe, maybe we don't try that right now. Okay, so instead what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and narrow these borders here on the selection. And you can see here in the selection, this little point in the middle, what that point means is that that is the exact tone that I selected on the arm. And then everything around it is the neighboring colors of that tone, whether it's a little bit more red, a little bit more yellow. And going up and down to the center, the center means it's completely desaturated, and the top means it's a very saturated color. So it selects everything that's close to whatever I picked. Now I can refine that selection by, first of all, um, changing the range of tones if I want to, like that, and it starts refining the area of selection. Now it selects primarily just the skin tones and some of the lipstick and the eyeshadow as well. And once I'm done, I'm gonna uncheck view selected color range. And now I can actually edit the colors that it's selected. There's a couple of things I could do. Number one, I can change the saturation of everything that's selected with these tools here. You can increase and decrease the saturation if you want to. You can change the hue, which is primarily going to be either reds or a little bit more yellows. You can shift the hue of the, the skin a little bit more or you can increase or decrease the luminosity of it in case you're trying to darken something or not. However, aside from this amount section, there's a uniformity section. So the uniformity section itself, this is where a lot of the magic happens, where if you want to unify, say, a lot of the skin tones, because in this example, there's green in the veins, the cheeks a little bit more red, there's a little bit of yellow cast happening from the highlights. 
And if I actually bring over uniformity here, you'll notice one thing. When I go from left to right, I'm going to push it all the way. You'll notice now the face changed to yellow. And the reason why that happened was, let me pull it back to zero. This was the original tones. And now this was the tones after bringing the uniformity up to 100. The reason why it changed to yellow is because it matched the color that I selected in the skin itself. So once I clicked on the skin color, whatever I drag my hue up in uniformity, whatever is selected tries to come back to the color that I selected. And so this is why it asks you to pick a color first because it wants to know what color you want everything else matched to. So if I, instead of you know, picking, say, the skin tone on the arm, instead, maybe I want to pick, say, the skin tone on the face, it's going to pick that specific shade. And then when I bring my sliders back in here like that, and then increase, um, not the hue, I should say uniformity, it's now going to match everything else. So now the face and the arms start matching closer together. So that's kind of you know, an overview of how that slider works. But the thing about it is you wanna make sure that you're not gonna drag it up to 100. It's something you wanna keep you know, quite conservative. So I always tend to keep it to like 40, 45 or so to get it a little bit closer and not exact because skin is never exact. The reason why you never wanna make it exact is because you start looking um, very artificial, like CG um, characters. And when you start taking your retouch and making it look very CG, you um, tend to lose a lot of people when they look at your image. So you can, you can over retouch an image, even if you don't do it at a pixel level. I think that's a big takeaway that I learned is when you unify things too much, um, even though the skin might be perfectly done and not overdone, it could still look overdone because things like colors might be too perfect or the light might be too perfect. So you kind of want to leave a little bit of uh, humanity in your photos. And aside from skin tones and exposure and you know, bringing back details, a couple of other things that I, I do on the exporting process side of things is going to be um, using, let's see, process recipes. And actually, right before I get to process recipes, I want to talk about um, the healing brush, because I did mention that a little bit. And in the recent update to Capture One, they released and this was just a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, they released a brand new version of the healing brush in Capture One, where once you click on the healing brush, and then you come over to your image, and then you actually start healing, what happens is it sets up a brand new healing layer automatically within Capture One. And it works just like Photoshop, where within that one layer, you can actually heal as much as you want in that one specific layer and just keep on working as long as you want. And it does a very good job actually, because I've tested this versus say Photoshop and the results are pretty good. And it works in the same way that you think of it where you simply need to highlight whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to remove. And then automatically it finds a source point for you to remove that object. Now, the one thing that they did improve upon with the healing brush is their algorithms are much better. So it takes account um, what type of skin texture you're working with and then starts using that um, in order to replace whatever it is that you're trying to replace. Now, another great thing is if you don't want to use it like a spot healing brush where you're simply just highlighting things and removing it, you can use it like the Photoshop tool where you're going to use alter option and click a sample point, say like over here on the, on the um, eyelid and then use that as a sample point. And you can use as many sample points as you want. And it works incredibly fast, uh, which is really nice. So in case you don't want to actually use Photoshop for your healing process, you can use Capture One. The only annoying thing about it, though, I must say, is that every time you do use the healing brush like this, as, as you're going through the process of it, you'll notice the original brush stroke pop up. Uh, and that I'm sure is something that they probably will work on um, in a couple of other updates. If you wanna see what, uh, what the mask looks like, you can always say, always display mask and you can see your brush strokes there, which is kind of interesting. Um, you can turn that off. And let me turn that into never display mask again. The other thing that you can do is by default, it has an option that says display heal and clone arrows. 
And what that does is it shows you your source points and your results all in one layer. So this is handy in case that, you know, you make a mistake or the sample doesn't do a good job. Um, you can easily display whatever it is that you're, that you're working on. So here I can change my source point and, and use something else entirely if I feel like it didn't do a good job. So you don't have to erase and reheal again if you don't want to. I tend to keep this off just because, again, um, in Photoshop, I don't really use that. But you can use this for as long as you want with one layer, uh, which is good because Capture One doesn't let you use uh, an infinite number of layers. Um, and I've actually done a full retouch with this and it's, it's turned out pretty good, which actually leads into the question of um, Edwin asked me, which is if I wanted to use Capture One versus Photoshop, um, which is a better program to use if I had to just use one. And to be honest, I, saw, I still probably would use Capture One because now um, once I did the healing brush update, I can do my healing work in Capture One. I can do my dodge and burn work in Capture One to even out the skin. I can then do color grading in Capture One because in, as a professional retoucher, you have to be able to use dodge and burn for evening out skin. Um, before that wasn't really a, a huge option in Capture One for a couple of reasons. Number one, whether it's a healing brush or dodging and burning or using any masks, the brush cursor itself, once you get down to a certain level, it disappears. It turns into a plus sign. You don't see the exact size of your brush. But now what happens is the brush size itself can go down as low as like one pixel. You can see exactly how big your brush size is. And there's always a cursor in the middle so you can see you know, where your brush is, no matter how small it is. It even works a little bit better than Photoshop does because at a certain point in Photoshop, you tend to lose where your brush is uh, beyond a certain pixel level. So Capture One has been really big for that for me. The other thing is that with Capture One, um, the way the colors process is a little bit differently. So when you open the same RAW file, um, say in Photoshop, the colors don't look the same. They're more muted. Sometimes they don't look as appealing. With Capture One, because they have their own color profiles, as you know, they tend to look a little bit more accurate to what you're expecting. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's, it's close as, um, as you're going to get. So I can do quite a lot with the program now. And the healing brush itself is very fast, so I don't have any slowdowns with it. Um, and I can keep going as fast as I need to. And considering that I'm streaming right now and also working, it does a pretty good job. My fans aren't even turning on yet, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, so aside from those things, that was the biggest update. And they also do have a couple other updates, which is like a before and after tool as well. So you can, you know, see your before and after is much easier now. I don't remember exactly where that was at the moment, so I'm not going to go ahead and comment on that. But uh, you don't have to, you know, do any weird workarounds to see your before and after. You have multiple ways of doing that. Okay, so aside from that, the thing, other thing I was going to mention is um, export recipes and process recipes. Process recipes are um, something really handy for me because whenever I need to export proofs or whatever I need to export, you know, 30 raw files as TIFFs um, or different um, formats in one go, process recipes allows me to do that. Now that's going to be located here at the right tool where there's like this one little cog, a single cog, and you can also add the tool, I believe, any, at any point in the process, which is located when you add a tool. And what I like about it is that I have one set up for TIFF Adobe RGB uh, 1998 in 8-bit. So for example, here on the recipe itself, um, I have it set to TIFF 8-bit uncompressed. I don't have any compression there. I have it set to Adobe RGB. And the resolution I kept 300 or 240, depending on the, the camera itself. Um, I didn't scale it down. And then I can immediately open it in Photoshop if I so choose to. And the other bonus is that on the other parts here, under file, for example, I can dictate exactly where I want to store it in. And here's something that I didn't know for a long time, and I'm pretty embarrassed about it because um, I was pretty ignorant to how I learned Capture One. I wish I had Edwin to teach me in the beginning because otherwise I would have probably learned this a lot sooner. But um, over here under File, under Process Recipes, instead of, instead of saying Image Folder, I would always use Output Location. 
And what output location means is that it defaults to wherever this is going. Over here on my output location, um, you know, I, you normally have to choose a folder manually, or you can, you can use the output um, subfolder within your sessions, which is fine if you wanted to do that. But what I like to do sometimes instead is I like to say image folder, which is where um, the raw files are, and I like to have a subfolder. So wherever these raw files are stored, there's going to be a subfolder there called working. And sometimes I like to do working. Sometimes I like to do like web proofs. So I'll do one process recipe, TIFFs. I'll call it working because I'm going to start working on them. And then I'm just going to hit process. And then what that does is it opens up in Photoshop. Um, if I so choose to over here, making sure it says Photoshop. And then it'll be stored in the working folder. Then if I go back here to say um, this process recipe, you can see here, I've changed my subfolder to JPEG full. So if I'm trying to send, say, full res JPEGs for proofs or whatever, um, it'll be sent to JPEG full in that, in that folder. So I have two different folders. I know exactly where it is, um, and it's a bit easier for me instead of just saying default to output, because then I have multiple um, specifically named subfolders there. And lastly, and most importantly, and um, I think people will be either shocked by this or not, I don't know, maybe not. But when I work on my TIFF files and I actually start retouching, um, crop, I either ignore crop or respect crop, which means that if I respect crop, any crops that I do in Capture One is going to be applied immediately in, Capture, in, in Photoshop and then brought over. Um, however, with sharpening, I disable all sharpening before retouching. Maybe this is good advice, maybe not, but I've seen a lot of retouchers do this now too. And the reason for this is simple. Sharpening in Capture One is just a filter. It's not part of the raw file. It's not, some, it's not information that you're gonna lose if you don't apply it now. So I disable sharpening um, in Capture One and then apply the sharpening later at the end. And the reason is actually quite simple. It makes the retouching process faster because you're not having to deal with um, you know, compounded information. You're not having to deal with the midtones that have extreme contrast or whatever it is, and however you define sharpening. But the pores aren't too sharp. You're able to get done faster. And then when you sharpen results that are already good, um, the end results tend to be a lot better. So from there, I bring it to cap uh, to Photoshop, and then start retouching. Um, and that's pretty much it. And um, in terms of the metadata and watermark. I just keep it as is. Sometimes I have used watermarks in the past if I need to say like proof on it or something. Um, you can bring in your own watermark by just dragging an image here and then it applies to it. And that's pretty standard. Um, aside from that, I haven't really changed anything else. And I try to keep my raw processing pretty simple. The other thing that I do like to do normally in terms of uh, portraits is I will brighten the eyes a little bit more in case I need to. And by eyes, I just mean the color of the eyes, not the whites of the eyes. And when you bring out the color of the eyes and you keep the whites of the eyes the same, it's a little bit more realistic because the lighting really hasn't changed um, based on how you're processing it. And yeah, and then from there, I just bring it straight into Photoshop. Um, and aside from that, um, Edwin did ask a couple of other questions, but I do wanna say if you have any questions, we'll get into that um, after I'm done talking so we can address some other Capture One questions if you have any. But uh, Edwin did ask, um, in regards to the industry for retouching and Photoshop, um, he did say what type of job opportunities are there and um, in terms of retouching rates and how to become a retoucher. So for me personally, when I actually began um, retouching and I started getting work, one of the ways that was really critical for me to get work was to actually begin um, reaching out to a lot of photographers and retouchers and I just was really ingrained in the community and back then I remember there was model mayhem which was really big um, not so much anymore but I was able to actually define and, and acquire a community of creatives that I started connecting and interacting with and then people started to actually message me and you know they were interested in working together so for me I never really you know cold call people I never really email people that I you know didn't really have any experience with working before and I had the luxury and advantage of just 
using social media from Facebook um, and Instagram wasn't there at the time and model mayhem and just reaching out being part of the community and going to um, events from local organizations from ASMP and other communities like that and just attending those events because you can't really put a price to actually connecting with people in person as much as possible and for me that was huge um, and then from there it kind of snowballed its way into people um, asking about you know retouchers and the clients that I already started working with they were recommending me to other clients and then once I started putting my work out there and started showing it off more and talking a little bit more about it and educating the community um, I started getting inquiries because people that you know didn't already have a retoucher started coming to me when they wanted to find someone um, that had experience with clients that they knew or that or other photographers that they knew so being vocal was a huge part of actually starting a business and attaining clients and the education side of it the more i started talking about it the more people started coming uh, my way in terms of the rates itself you know things have changed a lot over the years um, especially because now um, with education and the ability to, for people to come online and learn things easily, you start seeing retouchers from all over the world, you know, bid for jobs here in the U.S. and vice versa, where, you know, qualified retouchers here start getting campaigns from abroad that they never would have before. So that does come down to the country that you're working for, the budgets that they have for the jobs. And sometimes I find that personal jobs and personal projects pay even more than editorial and commercial work depending on the, you know, obviously the, the client that you're working for, but you know, it always does differ a bit depending on who you're, who you're going for. I would always recommend if you're starting out now, try and see if you can intern for either a studio, reach out and talk to them, shadow them, maybe even for a weekend, or just try and, you know, work out a way to get knowledge from those teams because people who already have that experience can actually set you in the right direction if not just for work, but seeing the way that they work as a retoucher, um, being on set with them, I think has been really um, instrumental in, in learning as well. So between those two, that's kind of how I began. That's how I started getting work. And now if I had started now, Instagram would have played a huge and a much more pivotal resource for me because I'm able to actually you know, connect with photographers just by searching a hashtag. And there's so many more photographers now and when you compare retouchers to photographers, the number of retouchers out there in comparison to photography is drastically different. There's, there's a huge demand for retouching. And the problem is people don't know where to go because they're not really talking about it. So being vocal, being out there, being available, showing your work, but also showing and educating the public on you know, what it takes to be a part of, what it takes to create what you've just shown is, is, is huge. And in fact, on my website, you'll see that I have a before and after um, section specifically because I want people to know the amount of work that goes into it, the amount of dodge and burn that it requires to do an image. And it just shows that this person has the ability to do and take care of your work just like they would themselves. So I think, you know, being very transparent is, uh, is really, really critical. So that's pretty much all I had uh, to say before I open it up to questions. And uh, hope you guys actually learned something in from what I showed you already. Awesome! This has been very, very amazing to just learn from you and like listen um, your advices. Um, so I did left my students um, a homework to do an essay of your work. Oh wow! And, okay. And they all wrote a question, so I know. For every single one of them has a question for you and also i have a very special person that is in the panel here its name is michael sins and he's uh, one of the instructors of the academy of art and he also is open up a uh, capture one class too so awesome hey michael over here listen to us <laughs> <laughs> cool so um i think for the questions um just gonna start in um in order so i think joy you could be the first one um, if you have your question ready, you're welcome to ask um, Pratik. Hi, nice to meet you. I followed you for years on Instagram, so it's oh, really awesome. cool to get to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a photographer, I was curious about like when you approach a photo, 
do you know exactly what you're going to do when you look at it besides talking to your client or do you need to like give yourself time to think about how you want to creatively edit it? Like, do you look at it, let the image like kind of simmer in your head or do you just go right for editing? For me, um, if I'm actually shooting the file, I think uh, the way that I decide on what I want to do specifically with that image comes down to the emotion that I'm trying to convey. I think ultimately, you know, besides skin, skin and fixing details, um, the color grading plays a pretty big role in that. And yeah. whether that's a white balance, whether that's correcting color casts, um, you know, that does come from, like I said, the emotion that you're trying to convey. And what I mean by that is when I go to a shoot, I tend to always focus on, you know, the feeling that I had that day, um, the kind of emotion that, you know, I was able to capture when I was photographing the subject. And mm -hmm. I try to put that back in based on the colors that I'm going for. When it comes to actually editing um, detail stuff, that is the things that really distract from my eye. There's never going to be a game plan like, oh, there, you know, um, I always do this for every single image. It's going to be always what's um, captivating me, what's bringing my attention to the, to the frame itself. Right. And then I set a game plan based on that. It's never predetermined or premeditated okay. unless it's... You know. So you go a lot by gut instinct too. I do. And yeah. it's funny, when I work as a retoucher with other clients, if they don't tell me what, what they want, I won't change much at all. I'll just, I'll just export the raw file. I'm like, perfect. It's great. Right. Let's go and edit the photo. And then most of the time they actually like it because they're yeah. like, you know what? You, you actually kept most of what I, what I shot. And a lot of times they don't really want a lot of changes. They want to skin. Um, right. What I do find interesting is studying the photographer's portfolio gives me a lot of answers. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I study them like a stalker before I even work with them. Like I literally <laughs> go in their portfolio and scroll down and then look at the images they've done, you know, what they prefer, how much shadow detail they like, how much highlight detail they like, the kind of colors they like in their shadows and highlights, you know, the skin quality they like, how much sharpness do they want. And then I emulate that, but make it better so that I'm kind of irreplaceable to them because they're like, ah, yeah. oh, that's like my work if I did better, you know? Right. You elevate yeah. their stuff to kind of meet how you have your stuff so you can be on the same kind of level in a way. Kind of. Uh oh, I lost my sound. Yeah. Oh, it glitched. Okay. Yeah, it just glitched. Awesome. Sorry. But yeah, Thank you exactly. so much. Yeah. Very cool. You're welcome. Grace, um, do you have a question for Pratik? So all of my questions are actually answered in this whole, um, like, like capture one um, like tutorial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it was like, how does one achieve perfection in a photograph series? Which you kind of showed us how to do, and like you showed us how we could repeat that as well. Um, like using capture one. Um, and then here's a. A weird question. I don't know if I wrote that right, but how do you make an impact and find your own stylistic, like, um, like, um, how do you, like, how do people, like, how do you find your stylistic photograph in your photograph or whatever? Um, like, how do you find your style in your own, in your photographs? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it's a good question because when I, uh, when I started as a retoucher, I had to make a decision. Number one, was I going to have specifically, um, you know, a style to my retouching or was I going to be a retoucher that um, was a chameleon? And I think this goes for photography too, where I've met many successful photographers and some of them have a very specific style but some of them, their portfolios look completely different. And I was really confused because I'm like, Should, shouldn't you be known for something? And then I met people who didn't have a style and they, they were very good at many things. And then I, when I spoke to them, I realized that they both had their pros and cons. With this person that didn't have a particular style, but their style was known for just being good at lighting, for example, um, they were able to then approach a broader range of clients because they were able to have multiple portfolios and dedicated portfolios so that if they wanted to work for like, let's say Chanel and last year's Chanel campaign was, you know, a specific way they could match that and show them that they could do this. 
Or if they then turned around and started working for a job for like Bentley, where they had to light cars in a very dramatic fashion, they were able to show them, I could light cars this way or light people this way and come up with something very unique. So when art directors came on set and they started working with those photographers, um, they felt like they could achieve a lot more than working with somebody who could just do one thing. And the person, the people that can do one thing very well tend to do well for a specific period of time, but then in the long run, they have a really hard time trying to develop something else and still keep that following. So I think like if you want to develop a specific style and find a way to do that, before even doing that, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing that? And do I want to develop that because I'm trying to find work that is just, you know, specific to me? Or do I want to develop that because, you know, I want to show people like this is, this is who I really am and what your future goals are. And I think either one is okay because I've seen, like I said, some people do really well at both sides. And um, I think the way to do that is for me, I've seen the way that that has happened is just a lot of experimentation because I think when you get really wound up in being overly perfect with something and you're like, wow, this isn't exactly what I'm going for. You'll never get there because even now when, when I'm on set with the best people I could think of, they never actually achieve exactly what they're thinking of. Like they get close, like they may get somewhere reasonable, but it's never perfect. And even though to us it looks perfect and it's like, wow, that's them. They don't know what that is. They don't know what that language is. They can only achieve the best that they can do, but chances are they're never going to meet exactly what's in their head. So you have to be a little bit more forgiving with yourself when you try to find your style because that never happens. You never find it, but you always continue to progress. And as long as you are evolving every photo that you take and everything that you create, that's progress that should be celebrated and actually shared because even if it's not perfect, you're getting there and through the direction of your community and you know, the people that interact with it, the clients that will help you achieve what your eventual style is. Um, and for inspiration, for me, it's always been museums. I love museums. I love um, like anime and books and stories and all kinds of things. Like I look at everything in games. Um, so I just kind of, look around without any bias and I explore new things that I never would have even considered and let that kind of seep into to my design aesthetic and then kind of put that into my work. And, I, and you'll find that it's going to keep on continually changing every single year to the point where in 10 years, you're going to look back and think, wow, I can't believe I even like that. <laughs> and then I have an unrelated question. Oh, uh, what is that? Um, wake in the background what was that for oh so my wife is a fine art photographer her name is um, bella kotak and she does a lot of fine art stuff and you'll see the the photo on the wall over there um oh, she has a bunch of fine art prints actually let me show you real quick let me, let me show you beautiful I couldn't hear you without the earphones. <laughs> but um, yeah, she does a lot of fine art um, portraits and she's a phase one ambassador. So she shoots with the phase one um, system. So, and then I do the capture one stuff. So what a perfect couple. <laughs> yeah. I was like, great. I get the camera and, and it's awesome. And she gets the camera too. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Well, I open up to everyone. Um, everyone that wants to ask a question, just go ahead. Who wants to go next? I know a lot of you have questions. <laughs> Jared and I have a question. Okay, cool. Um, we're interested in digital teching and also retouching. So do you work a lot on set? I know editing, but like, do you ever retouch on the spot? Like mm. during a shoot? I have on occasion, I don't do it regularly. That's not my main thing, but I have a lot of friends who uh, were my employees and, and partners that did go on to Digitech. Um, so if, we, if there's ever any interest in, in Digitech related stuff, I can connect you guys to um, quite a few good Digitechs um, in New York and LA. 
Oh, and San Fran as well. Oh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, Richard, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, actually, I was just something simple, but what are your thoughts on uh, current industry pivoting? I'm, I'm an artist always open, keeping my eyes open for empty spaces. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's something that's on everyone's mind right now, right? Like even me, I'm still thinking about ways to evolve and figure out what to do next. And a lot of my business right now is, of course, retouching, but I also um, put my hand into other things, education being one of them. But also we sell digital products for Photoshop. Like we have um, a product called Infinite Color, which is a color grading application for Photoshop. And I've started to realize that, you know, retouching alone is great, but it's something that um, I needed to do more than just retouching. I needed to expand into other creative assets and fields. So what I'm doing right now specifically is learning different facets of the creative industry. Right now it's 3D. I think 3D is very fascinating for a couple of reasons. I think 3D is fascinating because it gives a lot of power to creatives in order to create physical things, whether that's you know, products that can be useful for us to use in the real world. Maybe there's solutions we wish we had that don't exist. We can actually then become the, the people that make those solutions. So instead of relying on companies to create things, we ourselves can become the creators of the things that don't exist. And so I'm using this time to learn how that can be applied to our world. And also even from a, a retouching perspective, I've seen so many um, 3D artists who have started taking the jobs away from just photography because they're able to create physical products, um, especially the product side of things, and then light it and shoot it and look extremely realistic because the lighting that you can achieve in the 3D world is actually really realistic. Just the other day, um, they came out with a technical demo of the Unreal 5 engine. And if that sounds like jargon to you, just Google it, the Unreal 5 engine. And the reason why I say that's really important is because the lighting accuracy of that demonstration was just so beautiful and looked extremely realistic. It had the right bounce properties. You can change like how the light bounces off specific objects and how it fills in you know, into other areas. So the lines are getting blurred a little bit from what's possible with what we create in the, the cinema world versus the real world and retouching. So I think it's important to continue to evolve look at what's possible and figure out, you know, what else can I learn right now to supplement what's going to happen. And in terms of getting jobs specifically, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm focusing on the industries that are still doing really well. Like for example, a lot of people are shopping online right now. I'm seeing e-com actually go up quite a bit in different places, different countries is a different story. But I remember there were some countries that opened up and um, luxury goods spiked just because everyone was so excited to go get something out there that made themselves feel a little bit better. When things like that happen, it dictates what the future is going to hold in terms of what photography jobs are going to be there, what retouching jobs are going to be there, and how it's going to shape the industry, whether it's going to be more e-com work, whether it's going to be more digital work. So I'm just always keeping my eyes and ears open and to the possibilities. I don't have any answers, but I do know that the more I rely on experience and remember the tough times that I had and, and the perseverance that I used to get me through that, um, applying that now can come in really handy. And that was exactly what I did back then too. That's cool. You answered my question greatly. Thank you. You bet. Awesome. If anyone wants to go ahead. Uh, Adam, I have like two questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Pratik. Big Hi. fan of <laughs> Nice to meet you. Uh, nice meeting you too. So my first question is, uh, as a beginner, as a, like I do retouching as well. So what would you suggest? Uh, like, how do we charge um, a photographer, like uh, per hour or like per photo? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. we never get to know exactly how professional retouchers charge the yeah. business part of uh, it. So yeah. I would like, to, like you know, just explain how how to do it. When I found out that answer, I realized the reason for that was because there was more exceptions than rules when it came to charging for retouching. And this is because, and I'll tell you all the exceptions, which will make a lot of sense. Whenever um, I get a new client or whenever I have somebody that I work with for the first time, the budget question always comes into play. And the budget is based on a few things. Number one, 
the person that approaches me, I want to know what level they're at in their photography. For example, is it going to be for a commercial job or is it going to be for an editorial? And now when they say editorial, they refer to like online magazines. They're not even referring to like, the, like physical magazines. And so that can be a little bit of a problem because the editor, editors themselves don't have any budget. They're not really actually giving budget to photographers in order to retouch their photos a lot of the times. So the budget then comes out of their pocket. Um, for me, what I, what I tend to do in, in, at my base level is I think about what are like my yearly expenses and then I try to calculate how much do I really want to make per hour in order to break even. That's going to be like my number one guideline. That differs from different people, obviously. And I'll tell you a little bit later what my actual rates are. But that's kind of what my guideline is. What am I trying to make per hour? What am I happy with? Because And when I say happy with, it's funny. Whenever I started retouching for the first time, I started charging. I remember like what my hourly rate was working at, at my original career, which was maybe like 13 or $14 an hour. And that's what I did. I was like, yeah, that'll be good. If I could do that and do that part-time, that's going to be fantastic. And then I started doing that. But I never accounted for the number of revisions. I never accounted for the time for emails. I never accounted for, you know, um, backing up invoicing, all that stuff. So then I was like, I have to actually double that rate because for every hour that I put into retouching, it's probably 30, 40 minutes that go into the other things too. And you have to remember, it, you're, when you're retouching and you're so hyper-focused, you can only retouch properly maybe like six hours a day at max performance if you're like, you know, doing great. And then after that, you start to go down. <laughs> so it kind of becomes really easy then to think like, okay, I can retouch maybe six hours a day or seven hours a day. And if you're insane like I was, I did a lot more. But if you want to be healthy and you want longevity, factor in maybe six hours a day and then start calculating what your weekly, what you want to bring in per week. And then the things start becoming really clear for every single person. And that rate does change. However, um, when it comes to commercial jobs, oftentimes they have a budget. They either say per image or they say like per hour and you can negotiate them. Some jobs in the commercial world, they can be thousands of dollars an image. And the reason they do a single image rate is because they want to actually um, include all the revisions. They want to include, you know, communication, everything in that and usage. So if they know it's going on a billboard or something, they have to pay you more. So a lot of retouchers, they decide whether they're going to do commercial retouching full-time or editorial retouching or a little bit of both. Um, so in that respect, commercial retouching does gain you a lot more than editorial and personal work. Um, there's also other niches as well, which I don't do too much of. Um, but on the commercial side, always look for you know, flat fees that have a really high flat fee or an hourly rate which could be you know, three times more than your personal rate or your flat fee. Um, and that for me has been a big indicator. Um, for me personally, whenever I get approached by a new photographer, um, and if, they, if it's not a commercial job, if it's just say a personal job or an editorial job, you know, I'll start off with something like um, either an, uh, per image or per hour. I don't tell them the per hour rate. And the reason is this, if I tell them, let's say, for comparison purposes, let's say I have a per image rate of say 50 bucks. Let's just say 50 bucks an image. Maybe that is only gonna take me uh, 40 minutes, okay? Maybe that image is only gonna take me 40 minutes. If I told him my hourly rate was like $75, that's probably not the exact math, but let's say if I told him $75 an hour, they're never gonna come back because they think I'm gonna spend three or four hours on it. But I know that I'm only going to spend, say, 40 minutes on it. So then it becomes a lot more easier to say it's going to be this much per image. And this is how many revisions it gets you. And above that, it'll be a little bit more. And this is what I'm going to retouch. So once you have your game plan there, there should be no surprises. If there is a surprise and they say, oh, um, you know, I also wanted you to do this, then you can keep it in the negotiation and say, um, if there's anything else that's not stated and it does take a lot more time, it may be a little bit more and we can discuss it at that point. And so that's kind of how I base my rates. 
And that's kind of what my rate structure typically is. Like I hover around, you know, 50 bucks an image if it's a general image. And then if it's a non-commercial image, if it's a commercial image, then I wait for them to give me a budget. Sometimes it's like 250 an image up to $1,000 an image, depending on, you know, where it can go, if there's any compositing involved. And that's those factors that I use when I'm talking to people. And of course, they might not have the budget. Maybe 50 is too much for some people. And which nowadays it is because there's a lot more retouchers coming in from abroad, you know, where the rates are lower. Sometimes they might not have a book, but I stick to my rates because I know that if you stick to your rates, if they actually um, like your work and want to really work with you, they will keep the budget in mind. And there is a huge number of photographers that are in that position. So just because a lot of people say no, doesn't mean that the, the clientele isn't there. Mm. Does it make sense? Made it, yeah. And uh, the second question is uh, like how uh, Grace mentioned about the style. Um, I I follow many retouches, some uh, commercially like uh, Lisa Kearney. Yeah. Uh, she does only for like uh, movie posters and stuff. So, and, and you said like some people maintain uh, both editorial and commercial. So is it recommended to have separate websites or, mm. like, you know, uh, upload everything on the same website, just mentioning with different tabs or something. I would recommend, and what I've noticed is the people who do commercial and editorial work, they have one website and they have split into editorial and commercial specifically. Sometimes in the beginning, because I knew I mostly wanted to do um, portraits and fashion and skin work and beauty work, I either had a tabs for, um, I forgot what it was. It was either like editorial and personal. So I never really had a ton of commercial because I didn't think I was going to get into there. So I never had that tab. So I had editorial and personal and then everything else kind of uh, developed as, as time went on. And then I started shifting it from editorial and commercial. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Thanks. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Gavi has a question for you. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask about a frequency separation on Photoshop. Not sure if you use that. I was just thinking about that because like when I scroll through the website, that's what pops up in my head because like it's so silky smooth and oh. <laughs> I aspire to be like that. Well, I'll be honest. Um, I actually don't use a lot of frequency separation at all. And I know it comes as a surprise to a number of people. But a lot of, re if you ever work for a retouching house, um, I don't know now, because every, every five years it changes dramatically. But um, we are pretty much expected to know how to dodge and burn, um, to edit skin. And have you used dodge and burn before? I've used dodge and burn, but not on the skin, no. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I'll give you a good example. Whenever this is done, go to my website, and you'll see the before and after section. And there's going to be a video of my time lapse and I have a YouTube page with a lot more videos, but go there and you'll be able to see how I use dodge and burn on the skin and you'll see what I mean. And the reason why I use dodge and burn on the skin over frequency separation is because um, when it comes to patchiness on the skin itself, dodge and burn allows me to even out shadows and highlights to the point where it becomes smoother and you're able to keep texture perfect. Like you're not even touching the texture anymore. And so what happens is the workflow actually is that I heal and clone first, just like I did in Capture One, where I was healing all the skin. Once I'm done with the healing process, the only thing that's left for me to do is even out the patchiness. And if I can even out the patchiness based on light, and I'm evening out those transitions, everything else looks pristine. I'm not touching you know, and smoothing out colors, because what frequency separation does that's really dangerous is it smooths out colors a lot. Like it just takes colors from one place and blends it to another place, and it changes the human anatomy a lot. And it's not really noticeable by people who are in the process of doing it because they get really obsessed and you know, it's integrated into the workflow. But when an art director looks at it, or if you go up to a, um, a print ad for say, like perfume or cologne, and you notice the texture's all there and it looks human, they're all dodging and burning at a high level. And they're still contracting a lot of um, retouching agencies and houses to do that. And they're primarily actually dodging and burning to get there. So I recommend, highly recommend learning dodging and burning for skin editing um, first before frequency separation, uh, which because 
you know, once you can control dodge and burn and you're actually able to, you know, carve out skin in a way that's like carving out light, it's, it's an incredible, uh, you know, uh, feature to use in your, in your artillery. And then you can use frequent separation if you, you know, can get to a certain, certain place in conjunction with dodge and burn. But is it necessary? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is 100%. I wouldn't be retouching right now if I didn't dodge and burn because it would be too much like painting. And when you're painting, you don't have that control as you do with the dodge and burn at a poor level. Okay, I thought, wait. So we don't have to use the frequency separation. That's what I was asking. Well, I don't. I okay. know a lot of people do, and that's definitely personal preference, but you can actually achieve the same results and better not using it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Jana, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, we actually hit a painful spot here about um, dodge and burn versus uh, frequency separation because this is something that bothered me for a while with all of my retouchers that I'm working with, yeah. is there like a particular reason why some retouchers will like prefer doing the frequency separation? Because I'm constantly trying to explain that they're killing my contrast. Like, don't do that. It looks plastic. Please yeah. stop. And yeah. I'm not getting anywhere with them. It's just, ah. Oh. Yeah, here's the thing. You know, um, especially in the last, like I said, five years, because dodge and burn isn't being shown as much and YouTube has such a big influence in the community of creators, what happens is many photographers who are not retouchers will talk about frequent separation a lot more in their workflow because it's easy and because it's good enough. But the reality is at a high level and at people who are professionals who are looking at photographs from a commercial standpoint and are looking for realism, frequent separation alone isn't good enough because what happens is at a poor level, when you, when you blend colors together at a poor level, um, you end up losing what it means to be human. Because when you look at someone at a poor level, there's nuances of color, there's nuances of shade and detail. And that relates to sharpness, that relates to contrast, that relates to the anatomy of the face. So when you're blending the colors together, you're basically saying you know exactly how a face should look like and that will get you there. But in reality, few large brush strokes will not keep all that detail, that soul of the image there. With Dodge and Burn, what happens is you define specifically what exactly you're going to even out and not even out. And at a poor level, when everything else is evened out, you keep that realism there, that anatomy. And that's what's really important, is when you start shifting colors independent from sharpness or the texture, you start getting a disassociation effect. It disassociates. So the textures look one way, colors look another way. And it, yeah, it looks perfect when you're zoomed in. But when you're zoomed out, everything's like rounded. You know, you get that rounded face, that rounded nose. And yeah, it's color correct. It's, there's no blemishes, but you just took out the person. And so if you learn the tool, make sure you use it very carefully and in conjunction with methods like dodge and burn, if you're trying to go for the realistic, perfect look. But if you're trying to get to a point where you like what somebody has done with frequent separation, that's fine, of course. But you just have to know what your um, style is and what you're going for. Because it really does depend on, you know, if you're, up to, if you're trying to attain perfection or if you're trying to attain good enough. Awesome. And um, yeah, for the last question, Valera wants to ask you. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I had a frequency separation question, but I just got it answered. But the other question I have is, how do you deal with hair? I saw your video on your website, and you were clone stamping, I believe. Yes, yes. Um, but that took two hours. So do you always clone stamp? I do. I do. That's why I tell clients, like, if you don't have a hairstylist, know what you're going to be paying for because it's, it could be intense. What I, instead of cloning, um, sometimes what does work is using the spot healing brush 
at 100% hardness and just highlighting pieces of the hair slowly, it does get rid of it. Um, and if you don't want to be 100% perfect, if you zoom out, you won't really notice any imperfections as much. So I recommend starting with that. Um, of course, you can also use like the clone brush on lighten or darken mode. That's another option too. Um, I've stopped using that too, just because if you use a clone brush on lighten or darken mode, what happens is there's some parts of the hair that won't get removed because the way the clone brush works in different blend modes is that it will remove parts of the hair that's lighter or darker depending on your source point. And sometimes even within that piece of hair, it changes luminosity. So you end up like with fragments of hair across your image if you're going too fast. And at, at, you know, if you're actually delivering it to a client, it's not, I can't do that. So I end up either having to clone manually or use a spot healing brush to begin with. And unfortunately, that's the only way we could do it. Okay, yeah, because hair has always been an issue. And like in Photoshop, they've taught us how to like use brushes, like hair brushes, but it just doesn't come out right. Nope, never. Hair brushes don't work. And also one thing that I would recommend is that if you don't want to retouch hair, just pass it off as being natural or like that's what I meant to do. Um, and no one's going to like fault you for that. No one's going to fault you for being completely like, like no one's going to fault you for not being 100% perfect with your hair. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So now to close, I always show then a video of an intro of your work where you say, if you're not using Capture One, you're not at the top of your game. <laughs> <laughs> so I always find that quote very striking for the students. So if you just want to close with an advice for all the students that are, you know, learning Capture One plus Phase One systems, you know, to like motivate them. And I want to get Michael's question first before we go there. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a very quick question, and thank you so much for doing this. It's been extremely inspirational. Um, how important in the current market for retouchers specifically is it to have a print portfolio? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess depending on where you're trying to get work from. Right now, for me personally, it isn't. I don't even have a print portfolio, unfortunately. And the reason for that is my client base is pretty global. I don't have anyone local at all. And so for me, I didn't have to go and physically show them my work. But if you're trying to actually go in person and, and work locally, which I know a lot of people do, especially some retoucher friends that I know, they have a print portfolio. Um, but when they go into the meeting, then they show it to them. But it always comes down to the website first and your website presence, making sure that's clean and accurate and doesn't have anything that distracts from the message that you're actually trying to convey and the work that you're trying to get. Um, before actually meeting with any specific client or trying to get a meeting with an agency, make sure you put, a, put together a portfolio or a PDF of the exact work that you're trying to do with them. So show them that you actually provide the skills that they're looking for before you go meet with them. So, um, and then when you go meet with them, have something in physical form because seeing print still is my favorite thing to do. Like seeing the work in print is, is incredible. It, I end up falling in love with the photo like all over again when I see it. Thank you very much. You bet. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I mean, honestly, I think the main thing from this class that I really want you guys to know is getting comfortable with like working with sessions and catalogs and the organizational aspect. Um, because no matter if you're trying to be Digitech or a photographer or work as a retoucher, um, the management side is very, very critical. Um, for me, I think it was huge. And my first um, <clears throat> introduction to Capture One was when I got e EIP files from a client. And I said, what's that? <laughs> I had no idea what that was. And have you guys covered EIP files? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, and for me, I, I had to download Capture One and use it because someone sent me an EIP file eight years ago. And I said, all right, so the high-end people are using this program called Capture One. And now, a lot more people are using it to the point where it's industry standard um, from people who are at literally top of their game to people who are just, you know, hobbyists. And so this program has been instrumental, not only to my professional work, but even as a company, because they're always listening to people who have any features they want upgraded. So they have a direct line with their user base. So if you're ever trying to say, 
um, ask for a particular feature, they actually listen when you fill out their contact form. So I think it's something that I highly recommend everyone get really familiar with because it's not going anywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This has been uh, kind of like a dream come true for us to yeah. have you here. And, it's my um, pleasure. It's, I hope this is just the beginning of well, many other times you can join us in this class. So yeah. thank you so much for your time. And like, we really thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Just thank you guys class. so much. I really thank appreciate you. you all for uh, being here. And I hope you weren't too bored because I always got really bored when I had guest instructors in my class. So. <laughs> <laughs>